Welcome to the ATP Project. You're with your hosts, Steve, Jeff, and Dr. Doug. Ah. Dr. Doug, how are you? I'm exceptionally well. Thank you for I've having me here somebody. to chat. How, how do I know you? <laughs> well, we, perhaps people should know that we're sort of related by, <laughs> by law, if not by biology. Well, yeah, it wondering. certainly wouldn't be by choice, Dr. <laughs> Doug. So, you know, I, I, I still am amazed that uh, Beck let him in. So, yeah. And I guess you couldn't say anything. So, nah. yeah. I could tell you the story of our first meeting, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe later. Okay, okay. Wow, is it R-rated, a bit blue, is it? Not at all, no, oh, no, no. It's, it's actually about acne, so it's sort of relevant oh. to today's conversation possibly. But uh, Hang on a minute. Well, we know that Steve's 360 years old, so I mean, <laughs> if you were treating him for acne, how old does that make you, Doug? No, it, you know, I, think it's, I think it's a good fun st- way to start the story. So we just explained this. Steve is my son-in-law. He's yep. married to my wife's daughter. And uh, he um, he came out had to be introduced to mum. Mm. Uh, and so Steve came over to our home for dinner. And that's how we first met. And I remember thinking, you know, Steve's background is naturopathy and medical profession in naturopathy have often sort of yeah. fired bullets at each other. And yeah. I thought it's going to be a potentially awkward or unusual evening, you know, so I was sort of prepared. So anyway, somehow or other the conversation is always with me drifted to acne, which is definitely my passion as a doctor. And it, uh, That is your passion? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I'm very passionate about acne. Mm. I'm, I'm passionate about medicine generally, but acne is my particular passion because yeah. it's so uh, harsh on people. It really it? Yeah, uh, yeah. very much so. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm sitting at the table with Steve and, and some of that comes up and Steve said, oh, that's quite easy to fix. And I thought, well, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, tell me about that. And he said, oh, it's just a diet. And I said, okay, tell me about that. And I had a whiteboard. So I put the whiteboard in and Steve got up to this whiteboard and drew out all the chemistry <laughs> of the effect of, of carbohydrates <laughs> inducing insulin growth factor one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Without notes. <laughs> yeah, no. I <laughs> well, I thought, okay, no, this is a guy it. I need to take seriously. Oh. Yeah. yeah, and then the second part of the story is one of the papers that Stephen then gave to me because I was going to Bali, if you remember. Yep. And Steve got this paper out for it. It was about seven or eight pages from a German guy that he and I both follow. Okay. And I promise you it took me six hours to read it because the chemistry in it was so high level. Wow. And I had to read it over and over again to get it through my head. But once I finished reading it, I became a believer. Yeah. Yes. And that's how I, how I started using diet as part of my management of acne, and there's some lovely stories about mm. the, the success rates of that, which we might get around to talking about. No, I, I, I love that as well, too, and the fact is, how, actually, how old was Steve when he started um, sequesting? I'm not sure really what well, the it's word a, there's is. A, uh, bamboozling uh, your daughter? <laughs> well, there's a bit more to the story, though, oh, yeah. which I didn't know at the time until Gail produced a oh, photograph. Yes. Steve used to be a busker down yep. at K- Coolangatta. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he, uh, Gail's oldest daughter would not yeah. infrequently invite him because he looked starving. <laughs> yeah, it was amusing. <laughs> he, he's a starving man. He used to invite him home and feed him because oh, no Gail, Gail's an exception. My wife, sorry, my wife, Gail's yes. a great cook. Yeah. And uh, so she actually, they knew Stephen personally. Wow. And, there was, and, they were, and Rebecca and Steve were sort of friends on Facebook. And yeah, hang on a minute. So what's the difference between you and Beck? Ten years. Mm. So, I know. so you would have been 24 and she would have been 14. I wasn't dating her then. No, there's no, <laughs> no. No, no dating. Yeah. No. <laughs> they should just, they yeah. knew each other. She, I knew her older sister. Well, so you dated her older sister? Well, we were just friends more, more than anything, you know. And um, I'd better stop talking. Megan's, <laughs> Megan's, well, she's closer to my age. She's about three years younger than me. No, I don't, know. don't ask me off the top no, of my head. I'd have to look it up. She's probably four or five years younger than me. <laughs> yeah, that's cute. But, but yeah, that, that's when I first Amazing met her. When right. she was probably 14 or 15. Right. I yep. first met her. Yeah. Um, and then later in life, we caught up on Facebook yep. probably 10 years ago or something. Yeah. Uh, we we re met or something, and um, then we started dating. And got you married. invited her out for dinner. I, I remember what happened. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, how long have you guys been dating for now? Oh, oh, Beck and I, if I now. say well, 10, when you've been, 10 years. Yeah, about yeah, 10 years. Right. I've known about Steve that. quite a while now. Yeah. Gosh. yeah. Long and, long about and, and coming back to your story as well, yes. too, it's fantastic actually to listen to doctors that are. And obviously, Doug, this is why you're on the podcast, because you're open-minded. And we always say question everything, right? Because ultimately, you know, science leads to the truth and the ability for – and I appreciate – and I I don't want to use terminology that's not correct, but I always look at integrated doctors and people who actually look at different modalities and can take learning from that as opposed to obviously being, you know, very rigid in their views and anything outside of that is is, they're not prepared to entertain it. So Mm -hmm. that's fascinating that you've had some obviously discussions with Steve, the hippie, who's also trained in chemistry, Uh um, naturopathy naturopathy as well too, and then you're able to actually sort of learn from that. I think we learn learn a lot from each other because Steve was – 
with, is without you know, wishing to butter his bread too much for him, is a great researcher. He's really incredible, the things that he p- digs up out of places, and he's always sending me stuff to read. And yeah. I think, <laughs> like, I've only got 400 emails to clear, and I'll be there sort of thing. And uh, we, we banter backwards and forwards about the papers, and yeah. sometimes I'll pick up things in them that Steve doesn't pick yeah. up from my medical background. Yes. Um, and I'll say, actually, this is very, very interesting, Steve, but did you see this part? Yeah. And that's rubbish. Yeah. Uh, and this yeah. is why it's rubbish. Yeah. Uh, and yep. uh, so we, we, we have a yeah, – I mean, it's a wonderful friendship that we've got uh, because it's uh, professional but it's also personal, you know yeah. what I mean? Well, uh, and, and that's why it should be. I mean, again, you don't have to agree, and this is the thing. I think everybody feels like unless you agree, you're actually mortal enemies, but it's good to have that juxtapositional coming thing. And actually, no, I don't agree with this and here's the reason why because yeah. that's how you get to the truth of the matter. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So, yeah. so, so, Steve. Yes. Why is Dr. Doug here after yeah. that personal introduction? Well, we should ask who he is too. Yeah, go on. Um, well, you've been a doctor for over 50 years, I almost been. as old as I am. <laughs> now, that's that's a long time. So how did it all start and where did it all start? And- uh, well, obviously medical school. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, in uh, Sydney? Look, in Sydney, yes. Yeah. I, I, was, uh, I went to school, high school in Sydney, and um, much to my – school's absolute amazement I did all right in the final exams because I wasn't considered to be any kind of scholar uh, I was a jock you know I used to, yep. you know, it's always what sports season we know yes we're doing cricket at the moment yep. um, and yeah I managed to get a very high score in the in the leaving certificate and um, interestingly not in any of the sciences though my I, I came 10th in the state in modern history as I recall so because oh. um, we had a brilliant modern history teacher but anyway I got into, I got into um, medicine right. um, I, but I really didn't it wasn't like this oh, I've always wanted to be a doctor stuff. It wasn't right. like that for yeah. me initially. Yeah. But as I progressed through it, I got it right, and understood right. what I – what I, I get emotional when I talk about things like this. I think being a doctor is one of the greatest gifts that you can ever be given. You yeah. have been given the gift of being able to help people and change their lives yes. for the better. Yeah. And that's an amazing gift and I, I, don't, I get very angry if I see any doctor who misuses that right. and does it for personal gain or mm. fame or whatever – all I care about is helping people. I know it sounds like I'm trying to yeah. you know, beat yeah. my own tongue, but I, I mean it. I like helping people. I really get a lot of pleasure out of it. No, I remember last time that we spoke and you were talking about, um, I, I can't remember, it was an affliction on a woman's face. I'm not sure if it was um, a, a mole. Yeah, we're or... going to talk about that one. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk about it now if you like. Yeah, yeah. let's okay. do that. Because I, I just remember, I can't even remember the yeah. exact story, but I remember the passion mm-hmm. because you genuinely care mm-hmm. about people. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's the thing that cuts through. Um, because you genuinely want the best for that person. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that in, in any healer, mm-hmm. um, whether it's quackery. Uh, do you, you know, look at me when you say that? I do, Steve, because yeah, you remind me of a duck. Um, but, but whether it's, you know, whether it's accepted Western or whether it's, you know, Ayurvedic or Chinese or what, mm. people typically, the ones that really get the best results are the ones that have a deep connection and passion to actually heal and help. Mm. Uh, and again, that's what came across um, you know, when we were talking about this, and, uh, uh, please tell the story because I actually can't remember. I just remember the emotion. That quite sounds a, yeah, yeah, no, it's yeah. quite a few years ago, probably now it'll be twenty years ago. The story, um, but one of the techniques that I brought back to some extent by accident from America was a method for taking moles off that didn't involve cutting the mole out, but rather right. shaving the mole until it's, the skin was completely smooth. Yeah, right. Okay. And the, the benefit of doing it that way is if you cut skin, generally you will leave a scar, albeit a plastic yeah. surgeon sometimes really good at hiding scars and making them very hard to see. Right. But you will leave a scar. But yeah. with the shaving technique, you don't. The issue, only issue with the shaving technique basically is the potential the skin colour will not necessarily match the surrounding skin at the end of it. They usually do it, particularly on the face. Right. But on the chest and back, they tend to be paler. Right. But people just want to get rid of the, the mole. They just don't like the look of them. Yeah. And the story is that this lady presented to me, and she was mid-20s, quite an attractive young woman, except for one thing. She had a mole called a strawberry nevus on, on her oh, cheek. Yep, yep. And a strawberry nevus is, is, is a mole, but it's very red in colour. And in her case, it was probably the size of your thumb, yep. roughly, mm-hmm. in, in, in size. And she wanted to know whether I could uh, you know, help her. And I said, yeah, sure, I can take that off for you. She had that so, since birth, Dr. Um, Dr. Pardon? Since birth, that was there since yes, birth? Yes, yes, birth. Yep. Yeah, uh, got bigger with her, so yep. it was. It was. You know, I'm mean, seriously thumb size. That's a big mole. Have right on your cheek. Yeah, right in the because when people look at each other, they look in their eyes or the mouth, so they're always going to see something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I I took the, I did the treatment on her. Uh, it's quite easy to do. Just do it on a local anaesthetic. Yeah. And um, as is always my custom, I sort of walked back to my desk and 
um, to, to write some notes. And I always hand the patient a mirror and say, you know, have a look. Don't worry that what it looks like now. It won't look like that in four weeks' time. It's, that's what it looks like when I'm finished, mm. okay? So I went back over to my desk and sat down. The next thing there's this, ah! And I to I said, what's wrong? What's wrong? She said, you cannot believe how I hated that thing so much. And she said, I cannot believe that in a matter of five minutes you've made it go away like that. She just said, I cannot believe it. Wow. And it was like, wow. Yeah. Um, you know, that's life that's changing. That's life changing. So I, I said to her, you. would you be kind enough to come back and see me in two months' time? I'd like to see the final result. And she came back yeah. to see me and it was a brilliant result. I was so pleased. Yeah, <laughs> it was yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. The skin colour was right and, and it was completely smooth and all that sort of thing. And she said to me, you changed my life. Yeah. She yeah. said, I spent all my life talking to people with my hand on my face, yeah. kind of cover up the mole so they couldn't see it. And she yeah. said, now I don't have to do that anymore. She said, you don't realise the change in my life since you did what you did. Yeah. And, I mean, man, that's just the greatest gift. Yeah, it is. You know? It's funny, isn't it? Yeah. I, I think, you know, and people – Give me that any time. In terms of, I guess, uh, beauty and skin and, you know, Steve and I were talking about that saying – it's a fascinating area and there's so much science, there's so much help for people and we're talking about Botox and and Steve said, actually, Dr. Doug knows the original guy that, that invented that. Well, um, they, they, they brought they, it to Australia. Well, I know. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. You I know, can't tell the history. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. Oh, I'm yeah. happy to tell the history. Um, the story of Botox was um, t two Canadian doctors, uh, Alistair and Jean Carruthers, uh, both doctors. Um, Jean was an eye doctor, an eye specialist, eye. Uh, ophthalmologist, yep. Yep. Uh, um, and a, he, Alistair was a dermatologist. And uh, it, we're talking now sort of late late 80s, and Botox had actually been around for a while, but I'd never heard of it, I must admit, until about five or six years before that when I had a patient who had what's called blepharospasm, it's twitching of the eyelid. I don't know oh, if you've ever been super tired and your eyelid yeah, starts yeah, flicking on you. I actually had that. Okay, it's called, a, well, if it happens 24 hours a day, seven days a week, <laughs> it's really, really annoying, and it's called essential blepharospasm. And Botox was perfect for it. It's quite interesting, actually, going back and look at some of the old papers. I can't believe the doses they used. They were massive. Right. These days, a tenth of the doses they used to <laughs> and, use. And it was used to treat that sort of blepharism. Yes, yes exactly. Stop, okay. the ble stop the eye from twitching. Yeah. Uh, um, in some cases permanently, but most cases needed to be retreated. But the, typically, blepharospasm only affects one eye. Okay, so the patients will come to inject. Sorry, to I should explain to inject a blepharospasm. You have to inject around the outer edge, not of the eye, but of the you know the bone or whatever, the skin out in that area, the muscles out there that's causing the trouble. And so they'd only just inject the one side. And people used to come back for their two week check to see whether it was working or not, and they'd say. It's really great. I'm really happy. But could you check the other side for me? All the lines on my face have disappeared on that side, on the other side. You know, yeah. the skin's lovely and smooth. And, and so Jean obviously is telling Alistair about this, and they both sort of think, maybe we're onto something here. <laughs> and so they start doing some research. And initially, all the research was done on the lines around the eyes, though that's not the most common place to treat anymore. But that's where they where did is the, the most research. Common place to treat? The, what's, that's called your glabella, the area between your eyebrows, oh, really? the frown lines. Mm. Those vertical lines there are called the lion's lines, as in ground. Lines. Actually, you don't have very many lines there. Have you been? No, I don't. Well, I don't frown a lot, but I raise my eyebrows a lot because I've got. I'm a typical bloke. I've got brow ptosis. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> so yeah. you raise your eyebrows all the time. Um, so that's how it started. Okay, yeah. they, they they basically started researching it, and then they eventually published. And Stephen and I've been trying to find the paper, but we yeah. haven't really found it. But I think they published about 1989 wow. on the cosmetic use of Botox yep. uh, to prevent the wrinkles around the eyes. And from there, they expanded it into other uses, which was forehead lines right. and the glabella, and yep. and so it goes on. Look at it but, now. But I guess we talk about Botox, but what is the most common procedure you see? It, it within Botox? Botox or within cosmetic medicine? With, within within cosmetic medicine. Botox, yeah. definitely. Let's, yeah. well, actually, let's just stop for a moment and talk about the word Botox and get okay. it so we're all now on the same page. Yeah. It's a trademark, right? Thank you. Botox yeah. is a trade name. Yep. Okay? Yeah. It belongs to a company. I don't, Allegan sold themselves to... Uh, I can't think of the name of the company now, but anyway, it used to be Allegan. Mm. Um, but the actual active ingredient in Botox is botulinum toxin, okay? Mm. So let's preferably use the word botulinum toxin yes. so we're, we're not covering trademarks here, yeah. okay? Yeah. And just so everybody knows, there are in Australia three versions of botulinum toxin that you can use. One is called Botox, right. uh, a, a trade name which is fiercely defended by the company I that bet. owns it because it's, oh, a, yeah. it's a, almost a household it, name. It's, it's kind of like, um, you know, in New Zealand, we say, oh, get the chili bin. Or the you say, bun, yeah. get the esky, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like,
like that's actually a, a brand name. There's yeah. a few mm. things where it becomes um, synonymous with correct because well, it's like Kleenex it. tissues. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah, <laughs> and, and Glad Wrap and all no, that sort of stuff as opposed coke, to cling yeah. wrap. Mm. Yep. So yes. So there's two others. One's called Zeeman, spelt with an X, X E O M I N, right? And then which is made in Germany, and then the third one is a product called Disport, which is made in France, to my recollection. Okay. Um, the thing that did, I think we're seeing this as an information podcast. I think there's something that people need to understand uh, about the three products. Basically, Xeomin and Botox are 100% identical to each other in mu- virtually every w- way in relation to dosage and strength and all that sort of stuff. Right. Whereas Disport's different. Okay. And it's not different because it's a different stuff. It's different because it's tested in a different way. Oh. Because it's not, this is not something you measure in grams. You measure it in units. Right. I won't, I'll just stress people. I'll tell you how the units are measured. So we won't go there. Oh, okay. But just <laughs> what <but>, why? <laughs> well, basically, they inject it into a mouse into the ab- into the, inside the abdominal cavity, and it's the dose that will kill the mouse. Else. Basically, if I've got one unit of zeomin or, or Botox in this hand, I need to have roughly two and a half units of Disport. Really? Okay. When we first came out, it used to be three, but it came down to two and a half. And this is the tricky part about advertising because people quite commonly advertise, I hear it quite a lot down on the Gold Coast, 100 units of botulinum toxin. The question is, which one? Ah, <laughs> right. Because if it's 100 units of Botox, it's 250 of Disport, which is a lot. Yeah, right. If it's 100 units of Disport, then I can't quickly do the maths in my head, Stephen, would be faster. It would be 40. Thank you. <laughs> it would be 40 units of Botox, Sorry, not 100. Stop it. You, you get the idea? I do. So, so, I mean, my question to you is, and again, I appreciate you're not paid, sponsored or anything, but do you have a preferential between which one or are they both the same, but you just have to use a bit more on the other one? Is is there one that's better than the other, in your opinion? Yes. Which one? Disport. Right. That's ah, <laughs> what I always use. Yeah. yeah. I've yeah. been using it for 22 years. Wow. Yeah. Again, it kind of reminds me of the story of Viagra a little bit as well too. It's sort of by accident that they found that it obviously had this effect and became a huge industry, right? Yeah. I guess there's probably right. a few right. stories like that. Oh, oh but, yeah. Um, yeah. There's lots of drugs that had one use that was subsequently found to be yeah. very effective in another place where nobody would have even thought of. No, no. One that comes right. to mind is um, aldo- uh, spiractone. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, spiractone, spiractone, which yeah. is uh, um, basically it's a block. Stevens, the chemist that blocks uh, antidiuretic hormone. Yeah, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. And uh, so, basically, it's quite effective in treating acne. Yep, and uh, also hair loss as well too. I've heard as well loss, yeah. because is it to do with DHT? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. It's funny because I had of spironolactone when I started my hair started thinning out, looking at different things oh, to yeah. actually use, yeah. and I looked at spironolactone or yeah. spironolactone depending. Yeah. On, I think spironolactone. But the only thing is that in men, you've got to be careful because it's, it blocks testosterone. Yeah. Testosterone, yeah. droopy yeah. dick. Well, <laughs> and boobs. Yeah, the whole bit. We yeah, well, we've seen that. <laughs> well, we've seen that before. I mean, Steve's seen quite a lot of it. Yeah, not experience. You don't. I want to know where he goes, nightclubbing. <laughs> but in terms, though, that's exactly right because yeah. I think with guys, I had a guy that came in one time to my to my retail store when I used to sell supplements, mm. um, uh, Dr. Doug, and he had uh, very thin hair, but he had a whole coating over the top of his hair, right? And I think he must have been using – now, I, I get it messed up in terms of the trade market, Propecia, Prosca, whatever whatever the actual – Finasteride? Finasteride, yep. Finasteride. But he had boobs. Yeah. And I'm like, is the oh. hair – Worth, oh, is the hair worth getting the boobs? Man boobs. Well, you can yeah. get them anyway, <laughs> but no. No, I don't think so. I mean, I reckon go all Dr. Picard, right? I mean, like he was a bit of a stallion. He was. Uh, for people that don't know, that's um, the Star Trek Next Generation. Yep. Um, we go, let's go back to the cosmetic world. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. What What are the some of the, you know, for, for any sort of cosmetic procedures, what, what are some of the complications that you see with procedures? Like which procedures have the most complications? What about the most complications? Because it depends on the on the person you, you, you know, it depends on the who did the treatment yeah. and, and but to some extent the patient. Um, so let's talk about Botox. We've just been talking yeah, about yeah. – we shouldn't use that word, should we? Botulinum toxin. Yeah. Let's talk about botulinum toxin. Um, one of the – it's just a good, good story too, actually, because yeah. it involves the uh, the founders of the cosmetic use. One of the most common complications of using botulinum toxin uh, to uh, on, in the face was to get a dropped eyelid. It's called a lidtosis. Right. In other words, the muscle that basically elevates the eyelid and keeps the eyelid open was weakened by the Botox because mm. that's how – botulinum toxin because that's how it works. Okay. Mm-hmm. Or just no, temporarily. That right, was, right. Okay, let's quickly do this one. Yeah. There is basically no antidote to botulinum toxin, okay? Right. If you have a problem, you just got to wait for it to wear 
off, right? right? Which it always does. Yep. <laughs> okay. Including death. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't kill people with much a lot of toxin by injection. Only, okay. only if you eat it. <laughs> only if you, well, if you eat the bacteria, yeah. 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 Um, so, um, yes, it was very common to get, not very common, sorry, that's not true. It was it was not unusual to get a dropped eyelid every now and then. And it wasn't, nobody seemed to quite know why it happened. And it was actually, with modesty, I was one of the people that discovered the reason. Um, and it had to do with the injection technique. It was the Carruthers injection technique that was the problem. Right. Um, the that, the, yeah, the people who invented it, right? Yeah. yeah. The, yeah the, sorry, yeah. The, uh, the, the essence of the deal is if, if, if all, the, all the people listening to this podcast put their thumb sort of roughly in line with their pupils, so put your thumb about there and have yeah. a little feel yeah. of, the, of what's called your orbital rim, the bone, yeah. roughly where you can see my thumb, yeah. you should feel yeah. a little bump, a little yeah. dip. Yeah. You feel a little dip in there? Yep. Okay. That's called your superorbital notch, okay? Right. And that basically has a vein, an artery, and a nerve which go through it, which comes from the back of your eye, comes right. up and goes up over the bone, yep. all right? Yeah. And the t technique that the Carruthers taught, which was a terrible technique, and I still hear of people doing it, was to basically get your syringe and you would actually come in at 90 degrees, so it's directly in this way, yeah. until you hit the bone, and then inject. Holy cow. Exactly. Well, the reason why you want, don't want to do that is because it hurts like hell. To yeah, touch I can the bone. imagine. Bone is very sensitive stuff. It doesn't like being touched. Mm. But the more importantly was if it's you came down sense. a bit too low, your needle could get into that notch. Wow. And that would allow the fluid to get into the eye because that's where the muscle is that moves your eyelid. Right, mm. right. It was Jeez. purely a technique thing. Wow. Right. Okay. And as I say, I, I certainly worked it out myself Ac accidentally in fairness. I was at a conference and there was a doctor presenting a case who, who got dropped eyelids both sides. Oh, wow. And um, she actually did a demonstration of her technique. And as soon as I watched her technique and saw what she was doing, I thought, that's what it is. I know what it is. Ah. Um, and from that moment on, I totally changed. I didn't do it that way, by the way. I no. used to do it differently. Yeah. I always came parallel with the with the surface of the bone yeah. and also pulled the brow right up so that you're way away from that notch. So when did you first start um, administering uh, botulism? 1996. Wow. So you would have been one of the first around? I can't claim to be the first. Um, in Australia? No, I would have been in, one in, of the in, first. In, probably in no, the on the Goldie, was it? Or? Oh, was Sydney? No, 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 it's on the Gold Coast. I probably was in the first 20. Uh, wow. I think, yeah. Um, the, the guy down in Sydney, his last name I'm going to forget, George, who always claimed to be the first person in Australia to use Botox for cosmetic purposes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I would have been in one of the. When, when I first started cosmetic medicine, there were probably about 15 people doing it full time, maybe yeah. 20. Yeah. Uh, it was a very uncommon occupation. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Still doing it today. <laughs> yeah, still doing it today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can't Monday's stop. I'm a baby boomer. I can't stop. Well, no, I'm no, going to no, keep yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it would be the, the, most, um, the, the most prolific um, treatment that you do. Uh, Tox, oh, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's yep. the most common yeah. by, by a large margin. And, and the average lifespan of using that is about three months before people come back? Yeah, that's yeah. just typical. There is actually a thing called the longevity effect, um, <laughs> but which is interesting in itself. Again, I, I've given papers at conferences on the subject yeah. as to why do you get the longevity effect? What is the mechanism? And the answer mm -hmm. is interesting. The, we were all taught that it was because the muscles got weaker. If you continue to put toxin over a while because they're not doing anything, they just get weaker and weaker. Mm -hmm. Not true. Um, the muscle's still perfectly fine, thank you very much. It just doesn't do anything. It just sits there. Mm -hmm. The reason's got to do with the brain. Okay, you've got to think about uh, how 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 muscles work. So, brain sends signal to muscles, says to the muscle contract. That's the only signal it can send. It can't send a signal saying don't contract. It can only send a message to say to contract. Right. Okay. Its natural state is to be yeah at okay. rest. Makes sense. Precisely, yeah. it's at rest. Yep. The muscle stays in a state of relaxation unless acted on by the nerve to make it contract. Yep. Okay. So when the muscle contracts, it has sensory nerve fibers in it which measure the movement, and those sensory nerve fibers send a message back to the brain saying, "I've just done. You know, I've just moved for you. Is that okay?" And the brain sort of says, "Great. That's still all working. That circuit's intact. Everything's fine." Now you put botulinum toxin in there. And all of a sudden, the signal doesn't go back to the brain and the brain's, it's a computer. I mean, it's a programmable computer. So after a while, it sort of says, huh, that circuit's obviously wrong. And so it takes it off the list. Yeah, right. And people will tell you that they just don't frown anymore. And my classic story of this is a lady who came in to see me <laughs> and she'd been having it for many years and she, was, she came and said, I must need some. It's been 18 months since my last injection. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, let's have a look. I say, so frown for me, which is well, you know, the muscle that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And you can see you do that classic thing when people try to remember something. She looked up like this and said, how do you frown? She, she couldn't. couldn't do it. Wow. She did not know how to frown. That's wow. awesome. Mm. And the next question I want to know. Yep. 
is there, and it, it's been out for a long time now, and I, know, I already know the answer to this question, but there can't be any long-term negative side effects of using this, can there? Look, I mean, I've been using it now since 1996, so yep. I think, you know, I, I reckon I've got time. a fairly reasonable batting average yeah. on, mm. on long-term adverse effects and the answer is no. Nothing. No, it's a, no. Which is interesting, it isn't is. it? I mean, the thing that fascinates me the most about Botox, or what time toxin, is that it's a protein. <laughs> Yeah. So why do people get allergic to it? Well, I was going to say, it would be remiss of us for people that haven't heard that aren't as old as us that, you know, botulism, you always heard of that. Yes. I mean, again, when it, I guess when it first came out, it's like, that stuff will kill you, mm. you know, because, and, and you said it had to be ingested, correct? And it, it was something back in the dark ages, pretty well, much. Well, yeah, it's, it? it's from, from meats and, yeah. um, you know, like uh, there was there's stories about uh, Botox. Tinned or, meats in particular. Yeah, tinned right. meats. And, okay. uh, the, Contaminated the, tinned meat. Right. Yeah. And mm. it comes from the word sausage. Weirdly, I didn't know that until recently. And I thought you knew everything about yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> <that. laughs> so expert. But, but the, I was reading a paper on the history of it, and the first title of the paper says this is one of the most toxic things known to man. Wow. Yeah, and it's like the first part. I went, well, let's inject that in your face. I mean, it just sounds like a. It does, a, doesn't it? It sounds I like mean, a leap, but it's it, it, it doesn't have any of the side effects. It, it's incredible. Right. Well, there you but, go. But the, the, the difference, of course, is between the food poisoning with botulism and, yeah. and the botulinum toxin injections is that yes. they're very low dose and very localized. Yeah. Whereas when you in, ingest uh, the bacteria and it starts yeah. reproducing in your belly and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But there are other treatments too you do too, like um, lip fillers and. Oh, all yeah. Sorts yeah. Of yeah. There's lots of other things that are cosmetic treatments. I think you should go back a step, though, first of all, and say the most important cosmetic thing that people can do is skin care. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, by skin care, I mean basically two things, okay? The first thing is protecting from the sun. Yeah. The greatest cause of people having wrinkles and mm. blah, blah, blah mm. is sun damage. Yeah. And, you know, I, I hope that this is not taken offence by the young, lovely young ladies, but I used to work up at Paradise Point at one stage and drive along the waterfront and there'd be these gorgeous young girls wandering along the waterfront with tank tops on and Ooh. no hat. Where's that? Having their morning walk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you know, you, I used to say, future business. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's it. Well, Steve, that was me. <laughs> but I wasn't wearing a. I wasn't a y lovely young lady, and I wasn't wearing a. Um, I had the puppies out, but uh, I used to do that. I used to all summer cricket oh, yeah. out on the beach, and you know why I did it? Can I tell you why I did it? Because I had really bad skin. No, and you wanted ah. to cut to pigment it up a bit. Yeah, yeah and, and, and and that helped to to remove the the. And I spent hours out in the sun. In fact, I used to get a bit pink. Right, no. I used to go and actually no, get a little do bit. No, don't and, do that. Well, I had cancers <laughs> yeah. all over my face, yeah. um, and I think I spoke to you about that last yeah. time, Doug. Remember, do you remember the one that I had underneath my? Um, um, I'll be honest and say no, I don't. You don't. Uh, well, anyway, I, I ended up. Um, so I say you know to get get, check, get that checked or something, and I was right, was it? Yeah, you're right. It was it was it was cancer. <laughs> Damn, um, I got it right again. Yeah, mate. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's one you don't want to be right about. <laughs> no, but I mean, it ended up I had having cancers all over, yeah. which is you know not not great. Mm. So, but that's that's my stupidity, right? But you're 100. percent Right. So, first thing is staying out of the sun. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, a little bit of sun morning or when the UV is a little bit lower is good for vitamin D. But yep. you're right; you don't want to base yourself like a lobster. Yeah, but I don't think that I don't think that sunscreens. I mean, sunscreens don't totally block ultraviolet light anyway. For a no. start, actually, that's an interesting topic. We, we've talked about this one, Steve. Yeah. yeah. When you go and buy your sunscreen, you look at the bottle; it's got an SPF rating on it. Yes. yes. What does yeah. that mean? Uh, sun protection factor. Yeah. What does that mean? Um, I don't know that you – well, okay, let me tell you from a marketing point of view, from a layman's term, um, I always feel dumb when I'm talking to the bloody professor and the <laughs> doctor, professor, but anyway. Um, we, we don't like professors. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, uh, it, it means effectively for every SPF that you can stay in the sun for that length uh, for – no, can't be. You can't say fifty times in the sun if it's an FPF. You can say fifty times longer before you burn. I think that's what it meant. I mean, 50 I'm just giving plus. That's yeah. absolutely correct. Yeah, right. Oh, there you go. Yeah. No, that's absolutely correct. It's not. People often mistake it as a strength. Right. And think, oh, if it's SPF 50, it's stronger than an SPF 30. No, it's not stronger. Mm. It just lasts longer. longer. And so it has yep. a bit of more, a more prolonged protective effect. Yep. But see, I'm actually a pretty intelligent guy. I don't even know how intelligent I am. So most people wouldn't know that. <laughs> but, uh, but no. Congratulations. Thank, you're one of the few that knew the answer. Thank you. I asked that question a lot of people uh, just uh, for the fun of it. Well, I'll, I'll give kudos to myself. There you go. I'm not <laughs> as dumb as I thought. It's incredible. <laughs> um, but the other thing is uh, I found fascinating as well, too, is that the natural SPF, that the remember the coconut reef oil? 
oil and that that yeah. used, people used to put on yeah. two and four and what yeah. have you. Um, so those do work, but you can literally only stay in the. Very if you could be in there for ten minutes, you can stay in there for maybe twenty if you're lucky. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. The, the other the, the, I used to do a talk called the five secrets to good skin. We won't bother going through it. The first one was don't smoke, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh well, I was going to ask you catastrophic. What that was. <laughs> yes. Vitamin C. Uh, uh, well, vitamin C is good, but again, no, no. But when you smoke uh, cigarettes, you're, de you're depleting vitamin C. Yeah. Well, that, yes. Well, yeah. I mean, when you smoke cigarettes, you do all sorts of terrible things. Yes. You know, lots of. I mean, vitamin C is depleting. Vitamin C is not the important part. You're creating. It's creating free radicals. Right. It's just the free radical smoking damage. is creating free radicals. And all over the and body vitamin too. Vitamin C opposes the action of free yeah. radicals. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's not the vitamin vitamin C not working. It's the free radicals being there. That's the problem. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, don't smoke. Uh, clean your skin. Most people are good at it. Girls are particularly good at it. Um, yep. But the next one is the interesting one that that I – with modesty, I was, again, a bit, bit ahead of my time with this one. Exfoliation. It's so important. When One of the greatest – and I don't mean this rudely, but one of the great cons is this concept of moisturisers. You know, you go to the beauty therapy, oh, your skin's so dry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's not. Uh, the thing that determines how moist your skin is, how much water you drink and how much you sweat and all those sorts yeah. of things got absolutely nothing to do with uh, the moisture level in, in your skin as, as you – Feel, feel it, okay? Yeah, yeah. When you when people feel their skin and it feels dry, what they're actually feeling is dead skin cells. Because huh. you've got to remember the outside layer of your skin is continually turning over. Every, mm. You know, not every day, but roughly twenty every twenty eight days, you get yep. a new layer on the top. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And, and the previous one is supposed to come off, but often they don't. And so when you feel the roughness of the skin, it basically is dead skin cells that you're feeling. So. Huh. The best thing to do is to exfoliate. And this is the story I always give to people. And I, 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 with modesty, again, faced a lot of opposition from dermatologists on this subject because yeah. they said, oh, no, exfoliating is bad for your skin. And I said, oh. so do you shave? And they'd say, yeah. And I said, with a uh, razor blade? And they'd say, yeah. And I point. said, well, you when you exfoliate with a razor blade, do you think you probably exfoliate the outside layer of your skin? And then I say, oh, yeah. And I say, so have you got terrible skin? No. Right. <laughs> good. So we both agree that exfoliation is actually good for your skin. Yes. Uh, actually, <laughs> so Steve knows as a part a dermatologist, I, I just think she's a genius, this woman, named Zoe Dralos. She's based in America. And she's written a paper now, it's two years ago, but she had uh, written a paper really strenuously backing exfoliation as wow. being the secret to good skin. All right. And saying that skincare products, why skincare products make your skin feel better? Yes. It's because they put silicone and stuff like that and it slides. Right. When, how do you tell if your skin's rough? You feel it. If yeah. your skin, if you put your fingers down your face and they sort of drag, yeah, yeah, yeah. then you think, oh, that skin feels it's terrible. It's like a slide straight down. You think, oh, my skin's so lovely. Well, you're right because after – I mean, after we shave – yep. I only shave a couple of times a week, right? It's terrible. I can't tell. I didn't even shave today. But you're right. I yeah. shave for you. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, I feel a bit bad. I'll put a dress on for you later, Doug. Don't yeah. worry. But um, uh, we're, we're kind of like that around here. <laughs> and, Steve, you can put your pants back on. Um, but I was going to say, though, is that you're Maybe. right. I think when you shave, definitely, especially if I'm, I've got lots of important meetings – not that you're not mm. an important meeting, Doug, but – you know, um, that you're right. The, the, the skin feels mm. good. It's got a, 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 a the appearance mm. of it is obviously better as well too. Um, so yeah, you, you're right. The exfoliation mm. part. So question for you then on that. Um, like if you've got dry elbows, for example, you know how the skin all goes all dry. Is that because of a lot, lack of oil? Is that because you're not exfoliating? Like not what, exfoliating. Not exfoliating. Yeah. We just need to exfoliate more. What do you use? Uh, do, I, do you well, use like a, a, a scrub? Yeah, like yeah, a, an exfoliating you know scrub. those black cloths that you can yeah, get you nowadays can, yeah, and you can, I, you I, can I, use them on your yeah, back yeah, and you've got to – Loofah. Loofah. Yeah. That's the only way you get it, your back. Yeah. But um, I exfoliate – actually, I, I'll talk a little bit about this if I may, Steve. You, oh, you know yeah. the story I'm going to talk about. Yes. Because uh, I've got some interesting news about that. I'm maybe going to get a research project on it. Ooh. Okay. Um, but um, – Basically, I'll, I'll reveal to the people listening, I'm 76 years old, okay? Um, so I was starting to get a problem with fragile skin on my arms particularly. So, you know, I'd bump up against a door jam or something like that. The next minute I would torn my skin. And, yeah, right. Uh, when I'm not doing cosmetic work, I work in operating theatres and one thing you can't have is broken skin in an operating theatre. Mm, of course, yeah. uh, So it was causing me all sorts of grief and uh, <clears throat> I thought, oh, you know, you're getting old, get, you know, get over it sort of thing. And then suddenly I thought, wait on a minute. 
one of the things that I know is that if you exfoliate your skin, one of the, one of the reasons why it looks better is because it generates, stimulates more collagen in, in the deep layer of your skin, okay? So basically I got some scrub. So it's one I formulated for a company a few years ago. Yeah. And I got some of this scrub and I had it in the shower and one of those little rubber things yeah. uh, with the things on. And I started exfoliating my arms every day in the shower, okay? Yeah. Now, not a problem. Is that right? Yeah, stopped it. Stop the not almost completely straight. I still bump my skin occasionally, but it doesn't tear anymore. There you wow. go. Uh, That's incredible, isn't it? Mm. Just a simple thing you can do. I mean, and this is what I think people listening would be, be fascinated by. Yeah. You know, oh, I love it. What, what what you can do just to help yourself, you know, just simple exfoliation. Well, yeah. So so question then on creping of the skin as you mm. get older, would exfoliating help to reduce yes. that? Because I, I hear a lot of people, uh, you know, talking about as you're getting older, obviously, you know, wrinkles and and, and creping of the skin, specifically for women on the upper arms. Uh, yeah, that some of that is very difficult to fix, but yeah, so that would help on the upper arms, on the face. It's also you also allow for movement, um, right. so facial muscles moving and bending the skin all the time. Mm, yeah, all those sorts of and sun damage. A lot of vertical lip lines on ladies' lips have got to do with smoking and yeah, sun damage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is there much you can do about that? Um, look, if in, in, in its mild form, you can use fillers, which we haven't talked about yet, um, but there's a limit to how much you can do with fillers. Eventually you get to a point where you just can't keep using them because otherwise you're going to make the lips too big and it's going to look stupid. Yeah. Um, the oh, other that technique- doesn't stop some people. Don't. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, we, we, well, well, happy to talk about that subject because yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the other technique is, is called laser resurfacing, which is basically yeah. a technique where you literally destroy the outside layer of the skin and the, first, the, the, the upper layer of the deep layer of the skin for want of a better term, the dermis. Dermis yeah. is your deep layer, epidermis yeah. is your outer layer. Yeah. You destroy, you completely take the epidermis off and then you get into the, into the superficial layer of the dermis, which is where all the collagen is made, and it reforms new skin and new collagen. And it's typically fairly smooth. Wow. I like that. Oh, I've got but bad skin. It's a real skin. downtime procedure. I've got bad skin mm. and I've got lo- lots of sun damaged skin and I'm probably going to pay for it more as I get older. So um, I'll be coming down to see you, Doug, and we can work <laughs> out a uh, little little plan for myself. But what do you? What, how do you rate um, like the different lasers that are out there? Because I oh, appreciate yeah, there's, there's, there's so many different – I mean, and what, where, how do you feel about dermabrasion and there's like new um, – you know, little things that they use now, like little scrubbers as well too, which kind of sounds just like exfoliation really. What what do you rate – do you rate them? What do you rate higher than others depending on, you know, what sort of thing you're trying to treat? I mean, what's your opinion on on all that? It's just a funny question to ask because it's sort of relevant to my career. Yeah, right. <laughs> do you, I don't know if you knew oh, that yeah. when you asked the question, but it is it's relevant to my career. Question. Yeah. Um, no, I didn't. Oh. Uh, I, enjoyed, I came to the Gold Coast in 1996 and I was working – uh, in a practice, I won't name where it was, but it was in a practice. And uh, I was in this practice one day. I sort of had a cu- uh, surgery downstairs in some treatment rooms and various things upstairs. And uh, I went upstairs and uh, there was a, something going on behind a curtain. I was sort of mildly curious as to what it was. And uh, inside was a lady whose name I must have said, I can't remember. But she was doing a microdermabrasion treatment yeah, on right. a patient, okay, wow. which I've never seen it done before, didn't know anything about it. I was very new to cosmetic medicine at this stage. I had yeah. been going for a very short period of time, probably a year or so. And um, I remember sort of t- saying to her afterwards, I'm gonna, can I talk to you about what you've just been doing after you finished? I'd like to know a bit more about it. So I said, what were you, tr- what were you trying to – explain the machine to me. So the machine basically had um, a, a flask full of aluminium hydroxide Hydroxide, yes, aluminium yeah. hard, they're kind of crystal. crystals. And what this machine did was to blast the crystals onto the skin and at the same time suck them back up again. So it was, you know, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it was like sandblasting. Yeah. Okay. And it was called, the machine was called microdermabrasion. Okay. And I said to her, um, so what do, you, what do you use it for? I mean, do you use it for acne? You know, I'm passionate about acne. Sure. As soon as I saw yeah. this, I was like, yeah. oh, that's perfect for acne. Yeah. Um, and uh, so she said, oh, no, no, we only treat acne scarring. I'm thinking, no, 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 you should treat acne. With them. She said, oh, no, you can't do that. You're quite, that that's not, not for that purpose. So anyway, cut long story short, um, I eventually ended up buying one of these machines. Would you believe it, Wade? Uh, it cost me $25,000 right, in, in 1996 yeah. and weighed about 40 kilos. Wow. <laughs> it was massive. Yeah. Um, but we started using it in my clinic in uh, to treat 
kids with acne. Yeah. And it was magic because right. it's a vacuum cleaner. Mm. Yeah. It's sucking out all the blocked up pores yeah, yeah, and getting yeah. rid of the and opening them up and draining them properly. There was a mm. magic technique. So I'm a big fan of microdermabrasion. I used to, in my days of, I, I, I don't know if you know, I had a skincare product business at one stage. No. Uh, okay. I did. It's still around, but I'm not, I don't own it anymore. Yeah. I won't name it. It's um, very popular. <laughs> Can we name it? No, no, don't name it. Don't give me any free press. I don't mind. No, I mean, no, but. Fine. Um, we can have people write in now. Don't worry. <laughs> Steve will DM you. Anyway. Uh, how did I get there? I forgot. I've lost that train of thought. You were talking about microdermabrasion, yeah, microdermabrasion and acne. And you know, we had a very big practice when we used to do quite a huge number of patients for uh, uh, treat acne with microdermabrasion and proper skin care. Mm. Um, we actually, there's a long story about that. I won't go into why we why I ended up developing the products. It's basically because I couldn't get the ones I wanted from America. Seems so I happen. thought my, my practice manager brilliantly said to me one day, why don't we make our own? And I thought, oh, that sounds too hard. And for the last day, we did it together, and she still owns the business. I don't anymore. Wow. Um, but uh, we, one of the products we designed was a scrub. Actually, the first product was a scrub. Right. Wow. The first product. Right. The second product was a cleanser because the scrub and a cleanser aren't all that much different. Yeah. And um, so it went on from there. And then there was a moisturizer and blah, blah, blah. Incredible. Uh, that's yeah. awesome. I love uh, it. Uh, yeah, that's and, right. and one of the great yeah. uh, myths with acne, of course, is diet and acne. And, and we, you briefly talked about it before. The paper published in, in JAMA, this was, but the Journal oh, yeah. of the American Medical Association, yeah. where they tested whether chocolate causes acne. And they basically said, nope, doesn't. They said, um, nope, ingestion of high amounts of chocolate did not materially affect the course of acne. Um, mm. Basically, they said that in brief, that foods that adversely influence skin is ancient and deeply rooted. So in other words, it's flawed. And they said that uh, as regards to clinical studies of the influence and diet on acne, perhaps the less said, the better. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> so shut up. American, you don't know what you're talking you about. They, they, they were ruthless. Wow. So uh, you, you want to talk about that for a minute? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's <laughs> funny because when I was younger, I used to absolutely swear black and blue that when I would eat chocolate, specific, I mean, lollies of any sort, honestly, but mm. – and again, confirmation bias, it seemed to be a perpetuation. Chocolate was the worst. Mm. I used to feel it really was the worst. I'd eat chocolate and literally the, the next day and the day after my acne would get worse. I, I'm, I'm, I would swear black and blue. Mm. Is it true? Yeah. yeah. No, it, it, well, it is, yeah. The, the story of this paper, that, and yeah. I, I was aware that it existed, but Steve, being the right researcher, has actually got the paper got for the me. Paper. The first part thing I have to tell you is that one of the authors I know personally, uh, <laughs> I actually spent a week at his practice in, right. in, in California, yeah. uh, Jim Fulton. Now, what's the other guy's name? Because he's quite famous uh, too. Uh, uh, Jared uh, Plewick. No, that's not And right. Albert uh, Kingman. Yeah, uh, King. Albert uh yeah, Klingman. Klingman. Klingman's, Klingman's formula. It. Yeah. A, he's famous for a formula called Klingman's formula, which is right. a sort of calls for treating pigmentation. Oh, right. Topical. The skin, sort of yeah, topical treatment for wow. pigmentation, okay. Klingman's formula. So they're fairly, you know, august deep. Yeah. Uh, but suffice to say, Stephen knows the story and he's yeah. the one who showed me because I've, I've actually made mince meat of dermatologists with this story quite a few times because <laughs> yeah. they still don't, don't accept diet as being a factor. No. It's amazing. And um, the, when Steve showed me the study and he, he picked it up very quickly, it was a placebo control study. So, you know, the story for our audience who don't know what that all means, you've basically got your, your chocolate bar in one hand and the stuff that looks like chocolate, tastes like chocolate, but isn't chocolate in yeah. the other hand. Mm -hmm. And you compare the two and see whether there's a difference. And the answer in this paper was there was no difference. Mm. Okay. But of course there was no difference because the, 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 the placebo was full of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> what, it just didn't have cocoa? Just didn't, didn't have, have cocoa. cocoa. Oh, my God. Yeah, brown colouring. <laughs> For crap's sake, right? <laughs> so surprise, oh. surprise, both of them had the same adverse consequences with acne. So it actually proved that sugar causes acne. You know, you know, you know the funny <laughs> thing is I've heard these sorts of double-blind placebo-controlled groups before and it's just like it's exactly the same thing, just – well, almost exactly. But I the just medical profession have been quoting, and I used to quote uh, it in yeah. fairness mm. until I met Stephen, yeah. you know, that, not that particular paper, but just the concept that, that diet had not been shown. And Stephen got up on my whiteboard as I was telling you and <laughs> showed me why I was wrong. <laughs> it's uh, terribly hard to put it. Paper, so why it? does sugar affect acne so badly? Do you want to do it, Steve? Yeah, sure. There? Okay, sugar, um, you have to you, – when you eat sugar, it raises your blood sugar level of sugar, okay? Yep. The body can't tolerate that. It wants to keep it below six. Yep. So it releases another hormone called insulin, yep. okay? So insulin lowers sugar. We'll keep it simple. Now, insulin binds with growth hormone yeah. to form insulin-like growth, growth factor. factor one. Yep. 
which grows shut basically, basically the pilus sebaceous units in the skin. So you get a buildup of oil in the pores of your skin. And then you get a bacterial growth in there, a fat-loving one called QT acne, or propionyl bacteria acne, and you, they, you've got acne. Yep. Now, IGF-1 is, is the bad one I was telling you about. That's also found in milk if you drink milk. So if you have chocolate and milk, milk, which is like a chocolate bar that has milk in it, like this has milk solids, you're going to get a double whammy. And that's why you're bad on, on normal lollies or candy for the Americans, but, but you're really very bad, bad on chocolate. On and that's, chocolate. I, I, yeah, I know what I always go. Probably yeah. better pay on, on, on lollies, but yeah. really bad on chocolate. That's interesting because the other thing, and I don't know if this comes into it, it could be completely wrong. And again, <laughs> does sugar reduce the immune system? Does oh, consuming copious amounts of sugar? I think it causes inflammation. Yeah, it does, does cause inflammation. And sugar, <clears throat> when it gets into glucose, is very similar to the molecule ascorbic acid. Right. In fact, most animals can make um, ascorbic, ascorbic acid, acid out of we glucose. Can't, yeah. yeah, we can't. Yeah. And monkeys and guinea pigs and a few other things. You but might be able to. I might. Yeah, I might. Oh, well, of course I can. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> You're closely related to the gibbon. So, so, <laughs> so the, baboon. Sugar, the, the sugar um, does drive inflammation in the body, which is a dysregulation of the immune system, we'll call it, because it breaks apart in uh, inhibitory kappa kinase from nuclear factor kappa beta inside the cells, which triggers all the inflammatory cascades, basically C reactive protein, interleukin 10. And interleukin-6, actually interleukin-6 is the bad one, not interleukin-10. So it really is a very pro-inflammatory substance. Okay. That's and probably, that's bad for acne That's too. a little over my pay grade, Steve, right. but thanks the for that. I appreciate that. I, I think part. the thing we should finish up, though, Steve, though, is very yeah. important here because it's not just sugar that's the problem. That's right. It's carbohydrates. Mm. Right. Okay. So um, Steve's got a brilliant slide because uh, when he's, he's done some presentations with with me and he's got, a, he's got a brilliant slide where he shows somebody with a bowl of sugar in the right, in the left hand and a bowl of pasta or yep, whatever it is. Right. In the right hand, says no difference. No difference. It's yep. the same problem. Yeah, into it. It, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a cup of sugar with a with a bowl of pasta. Pasta, and, and the pasta is two hundred grams, and the sugar is one hundred and fifty grams. Now, the carbohydrate content of pasta is seventy five. Now, people are going to say, "Oh, but it's complex." So, well, once it hits amylase in your mouth and in your pancreas, it's no longer complex. It's glucose in your yeah. blood, yep. and so it all ends up like that. Now, it might end up slowly or quickly, but it all ends up like that, yeah. Yeah. and that drives IGF one, blah blah blah. So, if you have a bowl of cereal, say, and let's say you have cow's milk on it, mm -hmm. which is full of IGF one and branched chain amino acids, which can also exacerbate acne to a degree, then you're going to have a bowl of acne, and then you have a, a cheese sandwich for lunch. You've got a yeah, acne sandwich. Yeah. You know what I mean? It really, no, it sounds dramatic. And no, I'm, no, but I love it. You might have a chocolate bar, which well, makes things worse. No, absolutely. And again, I, I, I mean, yeah. Hippocrates, father of modern medicine, that food be your medicine, and medicine be your food, right? Yeah, it's so incredible. Um, Fascinating. I, I, there's a few more questions I want to ask. I appreciate that we've got a. We're going to talk about fillers. I think was one oh, of the things. Yeah, yeah, we should up on fillers. Yeah. fillers. Okay. So, so what are fillers? Okay. <laughs> Good question. Um, well, we've all heard of spec fillers. So yeah, just yeah, start yeah, from there. Right. Um, I mean, fillers have been around. If you if, if you remember my story of how did I get into cosmetic medicine, it was through fillers because right. my wife uh, wanted to have uh, not my existing my present wife, my first wife wanted to have lip fillers done because she had vertical lip lines. And in those days, we're talking probably. It's probably about 93, somewhere around about then, so I was still in general practice. Um, the only substance you could use was collagen, okay, right. injectable collagen. Now, the problem with collagen was that it came from cowhide. Uh, so it was they basically got the, the dermis off out of the cowhide and they, they supposedly humanised it. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how one humanises cow collagen, but apparently you can do it. Uh, right. But regrettably, it actually doesn't quite match. Right. And so some people had a big problem with allergic reactions and all that kind of stuff. And so you always had to do test doses. So you had to do a test dose first, wait a month, make sure there was no reaction before you actually used the stuff, which was a massive inconvenience. It was, it was one thing you had to do refrigerated, which was a pain in the neck. Mm. Um, and... But it was a good, you know, it was a good product, and I yeah. certainly used it for quite a number of years. And then in the late nineties, roughly nineteen ninety nine, they brought in a new substance, which is called hyaluronic acid. Yeah. And hyaluronic acid is room temperature stable and is non allergenic because it's basically glycosamine glycan, and you basically can't be allergic to it. Yeah. So you don't have to test dose anybody; you can just use it. Mm. Um, and that revolutionised it. It just, yeah. it just made such a massive. The techniques didn't change, uh -huh. but the product changed, and yeah. that made a massive. difference. Difference. It made it much more accessible and ready, usable, and so on. And then out of that, they gradually the first product that came out was called Restylane, and it was just a product. There was only one. There was just Restylane. That was all there was. And then gradually, other manufacturers got in, and and they then started making different variations of it. So, mm -hmm. particularly uh, 
the thickness was the, was the key factor, which gave you firstly more longevity, but also gave you greater expansion. Uh, so basically, if you want to make somebody's cheeks bigger, which is yep. a very common thing to do, yep. um, you, you basically put collagen into their cheeks, but you want something that lasts a long time and absorbs a fair amount of water because, remember, uh, hyaluronic acid can hold 20 times its weight yeah, of water, as I recall. Yeah, right, right, um, right, right. So right. you basically want it to have as much holding power as possible. So what they do, hyaluronic acid, as you know, is basically just a long chain mm. of, of carbon and nitrogen. And what they do is called cross-linking. Don't ask me to explain cross-linking yep. other than I say to people, think of a ladder. It's got two sides mm. and cross, cross steps. And basically, that gives it the stability. The more cross-links you put in, mm. the longer it lasts, yep. but the harder it is. Yep. Mm. So there's this compromise. We had this problem with our bars, our collagen bars that we're making. We yeah. had a problem with cross-linking. The, we remove the, the cross-linking, they're soft, and the, uh, you have the cross-linking and they become hard. Okay, anyway, right. yeah, so, so different but same. But same principle. So, yeah. so basically now there are goodness knows how many varieties of hyaluronic acid out there, but I would basically not use anything else but hyaluronic acid these days. Yeah. Are there other things which are non-hyaluronic acid based? Yes, there are. Um, there are two different Two, two more sort of things to talk about. One is what they call tissue active substances. These are things that when you inject them into the face or wherever, they tend to stimulate a, a reaction in the tissues which results in more action, uh, more collagen being created in particular. Okay, So it activates the fibroblasts to start making more collagen. Mm -hmm. All right, And there's two particularly that are used um, for, for this purpose. I'll name them in a sec. Um, but basically... Um, that's a good idea because it's it's not – I mean, they eventually the effect will wear down, but they'll last a much longer time. Right. And they're supposedly natural in the sense that you're, it's your own collagen. And that's all well and good and true, but basically – There's always a but. <laughs> there's always a but. And the, what's the but? And the but is this. What's this business about making more collagen? And the answer is it's basically an inflammatory response and it's the body's way of dealing with the, with this foreign body. It attacks it oh. and creates an inflammatory process, which is not painful or anything, but nonetheless it ultimately ends up, for want of a better term, in putting in uh, scar tissue, okay, which, oh. but not in that sense of the word, okay. It doesn't, right. but it can, and that's the problem, you know, if with huh. some of these with these tissue active substances. If they get into the wrong layer of the skin, or they're not placed deeply enough, and so on, you can end up getting nodules, mm. which is your body attacking the stuff, trying to get rid of it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you don't want that. Yeah, exactly. And remember, so, hyaluronic acid, for those people who don't know, is naturally found in the human body. It declines as we age. Well, it's it's funny. I mean, you mentioned, obviously, the lip smokers and people too much sun. Um, you know, but men and women, when they age as well, too, they leave, lose the chipmunkness on mm -hmm. their cheeks, if that well, makes sense, the right? Face, well, yeah, basically, aging is about, that's one of the most interesting things. And I always start off with that. If I get a patient who's, I don't know, 50 plus, uh, which is a pretty common age group in my practice, so they'd be, yeah. they'd be maybe be mid 40s and over yeah um is that you the first thing i look at is their cheeks yeah uh, because right. that's one of the first places to cause to, to lose volume yeah right. because aging is a two-fold process it's a loss of subcutaneous fat yes okay but it's also a shrinkage of the bones and then oh, we didn't okay. know that until relative mm. mri scan magnetic resonance imaging scanning was the thing that that helped because you know that mri came in i was still in general practice when mris came in so that's oh, yeah. uh, late late sort of mid late 90s um, and so there are people around who are in their 20s and had MRI scans of their face that were still available because it's you know, digital, digitised and all that sort of thing. So they were actually able to take MRI, sequential MRI wow. images of the same person. You could actually see the bones changing shape and moving position, really? particularly wow. the mid-face bones. Jeez. So, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, all right, yeah. so there's not much you can do about that. No. no. Well, you know, you can hide it by putting fillers and things <laughs> in it. <laughs> well, so it's funny because I, I had no idea what fillers were when I hear of, oh, you know, she's – you know, he or she's had um, uh, Botox or, yeah, you know, yeah. you know, and and fillers. I, I, I always I, – I, I never knew what a filler was. I, I was sort of imagining some sort of synthetic sort of – Matt, you're, you're nodding your head as well too, right? I mean, yeah. I, I thought of something as being completely weird, weird and, and synthetic, right? Issue. But it's actually mm -hmm. collagen. I didn't yeah. know that. But, I mean, well, no, again, it's hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid. Really, if ever used now oh, because, so of the, because of the – It's all hyaluronic acid. But – which doesn't sound so bad, but you're still saying probably ha has some issues. Uh, well, well, the well the only issue from my point of view with hyaluronic acid is it doesn't last very long, and patients have this expectation that they'll need one treatment and that'll be the end of it, and that's not yeah, the case. Right, right. Uh, but again, we talked about the longevity effect with Botox. There is a longevity effect with with um, hyaluronic acid. Okay, but it's an interesting one, which I certainly never understood until somebody eventually discovered the reason. It's quite fascinating. 
basically when you inject a filler, obviously you're stretching the tissues, right? So you're you know, expanding them. How do you do that? By putting pressure in there, yes? Yeah. Okay. The fascinating thing we found out was that fibroblasts respond to having pressure put on them by making more collagen. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so wow. as, if, in a, if, what I always say to patients is that, look, what you should visualise in your mind is that you're going to need three or four treatments over a 12-month period, yeah. okay? And then you'll find you won't need any for four or five months, and mm. then you'll find you won't need any for five or six months. Right. And eventually you won't need very much at all, Right. period, mm. because you'll re generated all this filling volume in your face. Uh, now, we've got some questions yes. that we need to ask uh, Doug, right. from some oh, of our listeners some of them, as well. Some too, of them so. we've, oh, oh, my gosh. Well, well, one of the questions I got from the girls in the series is what credentials do you look for for someone? Um, you know, you're an expert. You've been doing it for 20 plus, plus years. You work at Rejuvenate mm. in uh, Rubina on the yep. Gold Coast. Rejuvenate if they want Cosmetics. To you. Yep. Rejuvenate Cosmetics. That's it. A bit of a plug there. Yep. Mondays, don't you? Yeah, on a Monday. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm coming down to see you. Yeah. Oh, I'm, well. getting, I'm getting the whole work. Oh, you're the whole work. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, do, I get do, to pick do, do, I hate to say, you see women say that. I just want the work. So yeah. it's like, well, that's not going to happen. Well, <laughs> uh, Steve's been telling me about a new surgery. I don't know if you do it or not. It's, it's very it's very select, but it's called an adedictomy. Have you heard of those? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm first for that one. Okay, all right. Jeez. <laughs> all right, question. When, when well, how do you pick it? How would you How, how would you, how pick, would you your, pick a component? Look, I think that's extremely difficult. I don't care what area of medicine you want to talk about. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, there, there are very good pet doctors and lots of them, and there are some who are very average, mm. um, sadly. Mm. And how do you pick them? It's not easy sometimes. Yeah. Often they can have lots of letters after their names but still not be competent. Mm. I mean, mm. so, I mean, I guess that from my perspective, the first thing I would say is what, what – what academic groups are there, or colleges and so on, that that, that are involved in this? And there's quite a few. Um, there's ones that have been around for a long time, like the College of Surgeons with plastic surgeons and so on. They, some cosmetic surgeons are not plastic surgeons. They've, they've trained in general surgery, which is perfectly sensible. Um, but so there's that, those sort of organisations. Again, dermatologists, because we talk about our story of Botox, dermatologists yeah. was part of the background of that. So dermatologists have certainly been involved in cosmetic medicine, but probably more from the skin point of view rather than from the fillers and the mm. tox and that sort of thing. Um, and then from that, from those groups, a few break, uh, sort of general practitioner type people like me yeah. and um, started getting interested in doing cosmetic medicine and particular fillers and tox and all those sorts of things. And we formed initially a society of cosmetic physician society. And I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, it, we eventually did what I recommended at the time when it was formed, which was back in about 1990 something. <laughs> That we formed it, I, I was um, I didn't I wasn't the driving force behind it. it was obviously, a doctor in Western Australia was the driving force behind it. But I wrote a quite a detailed letter, and she and I've been very close friends for years. But suggesting the structure for it and saying that we should have an ambition to turn it into a college with training and, mm. and all those sorts of things. And there now is a college called the Cosmetic Physicians College of Australasia. Yeah, right. And I, with modesty, was the inaugural president thereof. Wow. And now a lifetime member. Uh, oh, and again, no. you want to make sure that you're you're. I mean, especially if you're going to go and have surgery. I mean, you can't. Well, you can obviously go correct it, but you can't unhave the surgery, right? So, you know, yeah. yeah. Anyway, what what are your thoughts, Doug? <laughs> it's a very difficult. You have brought up something, and I'm probably going to be careful about what I say here, but it's something that's very dear to me. And Steve, like Steve's reaction was, I, think I, know, I know what you're going to say. Yeah, exactly. But one of my concerns about the, the medical profession, and, and it's all got to do with lawyers is that right. we that the professional bodies such as the colleges of X doesn't matter which college I they have underperforming members in their in their who are fellows of their college and they know they're underperforming they know they're dangerous they know they're incompetent but they don't do anything about it why? Because they're afraid of being sued. They're afraid of being sued. Right. So yeah. the problem is then, uh, and I guess they're probably more afraid of a lawyered up doctor that says you're damaging my ability to earn reputation. income yeah. because you've destroyed my well, re reputation. Well, doctors have all got medical indemnity insurance and that covers things like that. So right. um, it's it's a very difficult area and I think it needs to be tidied up. Mm. It really does. I mean, I'm not particularly fond of the bureaucracy that's involved with uh, with medicine. I don't think they necessarily do a particularly good job. Uh, but, yes, I think the colleges should. And mm. 
I, I'm actually the chairman of the membership committee of the college still. Okay. And so we actually vent people quite carefully. Um, that's the, the, I mean, one other organisation, there's a thing called the Australian College of Cosmetic Surgery, which is it fights long and violent battles with the plastic surgeons all the time. Because right. plastic, sur plastic surgery, I'm going to be a little bit rude about plastic surgeons for a moment. Plastic surgeons, if you go back to the 50s and the 40s, they were very opposed to cosmetic surgery. Most cosmetic surgery, as in surgery, yes. was nose jobs. Okay, people yes. had you know, noses that they didn't like and they would go to ear, nose and throat surgeons mm -hmm. who would do rhinoplasty yeah, right, to try and yeah. correct the, you know, and give them the nose they wanted, whether not necessarily the deformity they had, if they, if they just their nose was too big or too small, the tip was dropped or whatever, mm. um, they, they would they would want to crane. And the plastic surgeons were incredibly derogatory of this because they were all about, you know, treating people with burns mm, and, you right. know, I mean, plastic surgery was out of the Second World War. Well, I was going to say, what is a plastic surgeon? Plastic reconstructive surgeon. So these are... These are the people who put people back together who've been smashed. But why do they call it plastic surgery? Uh, well, plastic because it's malleable, I guess, would be the answer. You can change the shape and the form of it quite readily. So do they actually use plastic? No. <laughs> No, they don't. You can see, they see now, you, the, the, now, you, now Doug's of, going, why did I come on this podcast? No, they're going to the word plasticity and what right, that means. Right, plasticity right. means adjustable, changeable, because doesn't I, it? I have, I have never known why they call them no. plastic surgeons. No, because, I mean, cosmetic well, surgeon and plastic mm. surgeon, I'm like, do they use like plastic in their surgery to reform? <laughs> Shut up, Steve. Yeah. Well, plastic, they're called plastic and reconstructive surgeons. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and in it's fairness, because it's the plasticity. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Be yeah, able to mould and to change. Re re change them. And, well, you know. and, some of, and some of the skills that they have are amazing. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I have a privilege of doing some work with uh, a very, very sad situation with uh, patients who are having breast cancer surgery. And occasionally we will have a plastic surgeon in the theatre as well. Yep. And we will do the treatment of the, the cancer side things. And then the plastic surgeon will do a reconstruction and recreate breast. And, you know, some of the people I watch do that, it's like, wow, that yeah. is seriously amazing work. Yep. Um, really, yep. really terrific. Um, so, but, but the, the big argument was that plastic surgeons were very anti-cosmetic surgery mm. until, guess what? Ding, money. ding, the money. <laughs> yeah, of course. Show me <laughs> the money. Like, show me the money. And I yep. always remember, I mean, Botulinum toxin was, um, I could tell lots of stories, but I could tell, Botulinum has been around for quite a while and the plastics weren't using it at all. I had a colleague uh, down in Sydney who, uh, well, I was talking to him about it once for, in relation to laser resurfacing and he said, I want you to want to use that Botox stuff for. She just cut the nerve. <laughs> oh, like, cut the nerve. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, and so, he used to probably amputate legs with a saw as well. Yeah. Too, like. but, but suddenly, uh, you know, Botox, suddenly just took off like a rocket due to internet and you know all these other things mm. and all of a sudden you know the plastic thought whoops we're missing out here oh, bloody and uh, before you knew where it was the, the i think he was then president of the, of the society of plastic surgeons down in melbourne put out a pub, uh, press release saying that only plastic surgeons should inject botox you had to have a detailed knowledge oh, of facial anatomy it's it. <laughs> great i mean oh, yeah well, as you said um, you can make a, a bit of money so, so yeah. um yes the, the, there's a, a war going on at the moment between right. the plastic surgeons and the, and the cosmetic surgeons and uh, so I was telling Steve the story that I was actually in theatre a couple of months ago now and there was a patient who was having breast surgery for cancer and I noticed that she had a uh, what's called a breast reduction done and right. without getting into too much details her, her scarring was the worst I've ever seen it was done right. by a plastic surgeon wow so they're not perfect either no uh, there's good ones and fantastic ones yes. so I've seen some fantastic I mean I, I, Steve knows I had a skin cancer on my cheek cut out yeah. by a guy down down the Gold Coast really and he did the best job I've ever seen I, as soon as I took the dressing off I said I thought that is perfect wow yeah. sensational piece of plastic surgery yeah and um, that's classic plastic reconstructive yeah. surgery you don't take skin cancers and things off without leaving scars some of the reconstructive stuff is just mm. really incredible but the thing that, that I was wanting to emphasize is about a little bit about surgery is and I always like to talk about Michael Jackson because uh, oh, yes. I think uh, this is a, probably as good an example as I can use. Did he have some surgery, did he? <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> That's just a joke. <laughs> I was going to say, that dropped my jaw. <laughs> the thing that I always say about Michael Jackson is that it wasn't Michael Jackson that caused the problem. It was the surgeons who did the job. Mm -hmm. And they were doing it because they wanted to be able to say that they were Michael Jackson's plastic surgeon. He had multiple surgeries mm -hmm. where doctors, you have a professional responsibility to say no yeah. in situ certain situations, say this yep. is not an appropriate treatment, I am not willing to do it, and I advise you not to have it.
Mm. Uh, that's the sort of thing that we should see, and it, that doesn't always happen. And it's not just cosmetic surgeons who fall in that trap. I've seen the same thing with plastic surgeons. Yep. Wow. Um, so it's a it's a fault in some doctors that they don't don't know how to say no. Yeah. But but, but, but it right raises a question: um, When's too young for any sort of cosmetic work? That's a seriously good question. Yeah. Um, I. I <laughs> I guess the answer is that it depends. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, you can't have a broad sweeping generalisation. You've got to say what is the problem that you want me to deal with, mm. okay? Um, so you could, for example, have the girl I was telling, we were talking about earlier with the strawberry mm. nevers on her oh. face. I mean, uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah, sooner rather than later, exactly. Mm. This is you know, life changing type stuff. Um, if somebody came in and said, you know, they were 16 years of age and they'd been watching whatever they, their favourite oh, TV yeah. show and they came and said, I want my lips to look like so-and-so, oh, yeah, I'd that. be saying no. It's getting a little bit political or whatever it is here or emotional. I, I am very fearful, particularly for young girls, and I have, I have two granddaughters, um, who basically are being fed all this stuff I know. and uh, it's all about their body image. And, I know. You know, I go to shopping centres and see girls wandering around with, you know, very Next little clothing on, yeah. um, trying to show as much of their body as they can, and I yeah. think that's very worrying. It, it, it and is. It's, it's, it's not right. So it, it mm. just depends on the situation. I mean, I, I certainly, in fairness, have to say, because mother came, came home with daughter, the daughter was over 18 years of age, she wants to be a model, and she wants some Botox. Right. Uh, to, uh, sorry. This board, what I use. <laughs> but would <laughs> she have any wrinkles? Uh, uh, she she just wanted to prevent. She had a frown line. Oh, and, okay. And she yep. felt that that was going to adversely affect her photographic modelling. Okay. And uh, that's fair enough. Yep. Um, you know, I, I treated it. I yep. thought about it. Yep. I, mm. I thought, mm, yep. you're right on the edge from my <laughs> point of view. Which way am I going to go here? And because the mother was there and the girl seemed quite sensible and I've subsequently followed up with her quite a few times and I've been happy. Yeah. Um, with her attitude and the way she's going. She's not getting crazy, so I'm happy. But if she came in and said, you know, I want you to pump my lips up, I want you to pump my cheeks up a little bit, no, no deal. Yeah, Sorry, I don't else. do that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that, that, that's good. Um, <laughs> any, any unusual requests for things where you just go, my gosh, that's strange? I mean, I, I, it's even I were talking about it, and he was asking yeah. for a friend about penis enlargement, yeah, but we friend. said that it doesn't actually do anything. It just It's just all for show so that you can impress the boys in the locker room. Yeah, uh, which was the point of that. Yeah. Actually, in fairness, uh, that, if you want to know what some of the worst things I've ever seen, a yes. patient who had a penile enlargement would definitely be on the list. So, in terms oh. of botch surgery, yeah. I would oh. not let anyone. I mean, what? Yes, hey, take a razor and have a crack. You know, it's like <laughs> should we put a warning up here? This could yeah, be just don't, content, don't do it. But I, I mean, seriously, it. I mean, I'm not even really sure what's involved in it, but. Yeah, I do feel sorry for guys with really little wee tackers mm. because, I mean, there's not much you can do about that, no. is there? No. It's genetics. Yeah. Uh, you get over it. Move yeah. on. So, yeah. so, so, so what did you see? What was the – Oh, it was deformed. You know, it was, it was sort of permanently disfigured and bent. and Even you know, when it was – it went up? It was um, like that? I don't ever think I went that far. I just saw it <laughs> at, at the stage <laughs> when it was at rest yeah. and it was de deformed at rest. Oh. Uh, yeah. It's like no, – no, And a very unhappy patient. No, I yeah. bet. Mm. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's, oh. yeah, Stephen said, do you like chicken, Jeff? I said, yes. He goes, check this out. This is foul. <laughs> oh, I said, oh, it's Steve. Stop it. But no, oh. no, is there – so is there nothing else like that? <laughs> I mean, because, I mean, these are life-changing decisions that people are doing that are having yeah. – I mean, I, I think of poor – and I think most people think of poor Michael Jackson and go – Mate, you're a good-looking guy. Mm. What what were you thinking, right? I mean, I'm sure you come across this all the time and people making – and going to other surgeons and getting stuff that you wouldn't do, coming probably to your help for rescue surgery, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't do much cosmetic surgery. Um, I'm mostly cosmetic medical type treatment, so not a lot of surgery. Um, I basically used to do blepharoplasties, which is eyelid surgery, upper eyelid surgery, liposuction, yeah. that sort of thing, but not facelifting or boob jobs or anything like that. I was just wasn't interested in doing it. Yeah. Now, I've got to ask you one final yes. question over okay. time. Um, have you ever watched Botched on television? <laughs> you know the answer. Yes. Uh, my wife's an addict. <laughs> yes. she, she, she loves, she loves botched, it, does she? So I sit down and watch oh, it occasionally. Let me explain what Botched is, I guess. Okay, those who have not watched Botched, there's two guys in America. Uh, they're both plastic surgeons. One tends to specialise in nose surgery and the other one in breast surgery. 
Uh, but they, they're basically reconstructive surgeons in the plastics, in a, in a, in a cosmetic it, sense. It's, it's, is it real or is it a... No, no, uh, it's real. It's uh, a, they, their right. specialty is get, fixing up the botched jobs oh, of other people. Wow. And I would love to emphasize the fact that most of the botched jobs are not done by cosmetic surgeons, but done by plastic surgeons. Wow. <laughs> but putting that to one side, which is a bit bitchy on my part, sorry, plastic surgeons. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not, if you're listening to this, you're one of the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> not you. Not, it's, we're not um, talking about you. But um, yes, they, they basically get people who... Um, been had really really bad jobs done, or in some cases, people uh, um, who have got sort of congenital abnormalities and things like that, and do reconstructive work. And the first comment I always make when I talk about botched is they only show you their good stuff. Yeah, of course. Everybody's got bad stuff in their yeah. in their closet. They they don't they don't show you that. They show you the yeah. good stuff. Um, but some of their good stuff is pretty good. Extraordinarily is good. Just yeah. like, oh man, that is so clever. I saw them. I saw them do a massive skin graft on reconstruct somebody's cheek the other night because I was watching it, and the job was just mm. sensational. It was just, you know, unbelievably good. I can tell you a story of a, a local plastic surgeon. Sadly, he left town now, which is sad. But he, um, I had a patient come and see me cosmetically, and she she uh, mentioned to me because I was going to put some tox up in uh, up in a brow area that she'd had a skin cancer taken off her nose and had what's called a glabella flap. And for those listening, basically you sort of put your hand between your eyebrows, that's your glabella, and that skin there is quite mobile. You can move it around very yeah. easily, so you can actually lift it off and move it down and put, tr transfer it down onto ah, the nose as a graft. It's like a Mohs surgery, is it? Oh uh, No, Mohs is different. I'll, I'll tell you about why Mohs surgery if you're interested, but <laughs> yeah. it's different. Um, so it's called a glabella flap, it's, and it's because it's got its own circulation. They tend to do very well. You oh. can put the full thickness. You don't have to do partial thickness. You can do full thickness. And she said, yes, I've had this glabella flap and you know, full thickness graph. And I said, really? I said, do you mind if I have a close look at that? I can't see anything. So I got my magnifying loop, which gives me four times magnification, and got up really close, and I could not see any evidence wow. whatsoever of that work. And this dude's left town. And he's necessarily left town. He's yeah. Also, I've seen him in operating theatres doing breast reconstruction. He's seriously good. Wow. Um, but anyway, we've lost him, unfortunately. That is a shame. But um, so that's, you know, the sort of level of surgery I've seen on botched a couple of times. But yeah. so I always say, they only show you their good stuff. Yeah. They don't show you their best stuff. Well, uh, you their know. bad stuff, sorry. S S Steve took you down the, the salacious yeah. track. I'm <laughs> going to take you down the other good route. So I love that story about mm. the, the lady with the um, – uh, the strawberry. Um, kind of thing. Mm. Have you got any other good news stories like that to leave us with? Um, I mean, and the I think the one that I, I would tell because I bring because Steve's part of the story um, mm. is a, a patient that I have in a country clinic that I do. I, I do a little trip out in the country once a month doing cosmetic work. Um, and this young lady came in to see me. Uh, she was aged twenty ish at the time, nineteen twenty. Um, and she saw a little sign out the outside. That I, I work out of a beauty therapy salon up there, which is sort of the most convenient place to work from. And she saw a sign up that I was going to be there and she came in and asked the la lady who owned it, was there anything that I might be able to do to help her with her acne? Mm. And um, so the, the person who owned the salon knew that I was very passionate and interested in acne and so she, she said, I'm sure he'll see you. Um, so I saw this girl. And her story was that she was bipolar, so she had you know, man a manic depressive disorder, bipolar disorder. Um, she also was deaf in one ear and had a hearing aid in it. Um, she had very bad family background, uh, alcoholism and all sorts of issues. She lived by herself with her pet bird. But I just felt very sorry for her. She had horrendous acne, just as bad as it – not as bad as it gets. I've seen worse, but not many. Right. And um, so I said to her, yeah, I can treat you. And this – I'm not blowing myself up, but I was happy to treat her for nothing. Yeah. I didn't, didn't ever charge her. Yeah. My wife used to do microdermabrasions on her for free, mm. uh, and we used to buy and buy skincare products for her and we'd buy all sorts of things for her. Yeah. Um, but my biggest worry was because Steve, had, in, in, by this stage, had convinced me about diet. I'm thinking, oh, I don't think this girl's got the intelligence mm. to do what I wanted to do. You know, yeah. she just won't be able to stick to a diet. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time talking to her. We actually went, took her down to Woolworths or Coles and bought food for her to show her the sort of food we wanted her to eat. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, so she started on the diet, and uh, I always remember she rang me up after a month. I was just about to go back, back, back up there, and she rang me up and said, "Nothing's working. It's not not any better." And one of the things I would say to people about acne is the way you assess improvement in acne is not by the redness of the skin, which is the last thing to disappear. It's the lumps. Right. It's the bumps. If the bumps are disappearing and getting less and less and less, then you've got less active acne. Right. And eventually the redness will go away. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, when I saw her after a month, I was stunned by how much better she was. 
Um, and that know, was just through doing the mainly the dermabrasion and, abrasion? Uh, and skincare. Right. Like we bought the skincare products for her yep. and, this is the and, and antibiotics and, and yep. all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and as I go, I used to do microdermabrasions on her and what have you. I think she did little chemical peels and all those sort of things. And after three months of doing that, I promise you her skin was completely smooth. She I've had seen no photos. active lesions whatsoever. It was freaky. Oh, mm. wow. Like it was different people. Like or, or it was it was amazing. Uh, uh, absolutely oh, phenomenal. I mean, sort of goosebump stuff. Uh, um, this interesting, more interesting part to the story. Uh, <laughs> she so we got to completely settled down, and but we sort of stayed in touch. She used to drop in and say hello and all that sort of thing. And then all of a sudden she went bad again. And I thought, what's going on? And, of course, she'd gone off the diet. Ah. But she also had some symptoms consistent with leaky gut syndrome. Do you remember mm. that, Steve? Yep, yep. And fortunately she went to a naturopath uh, in, in the town, I won't name the town, into the town, who beat her up immediately about a diet and put her back on the low-carbohydrate diet and the acne completely went away again. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And I, the thing that I always remember the most about talking to her was, you know, to sort of she um, say to her, you're obviously a lot happier and so on. I could see it in herself. I said, you know, what difference has this made to your life, you know, that you're now we've got your skin better? And she said, when I talk to people, they look at me. Oh. Previously, mm. they wouldn't look at me. Wow. You think about living life without people look, people looking away as they talk to you because yeah. they can't stand looking at you. Yeah. That's amazing. And that's Incredible. that's making difference to people's lives. Oh, it's, that's and, huge. And in that case, I did it for nothing. Yeah, I didn't make any money out of it, but I just loved doing it. Yeah, and the funny thing is, I guess – it, w it wouldn't have made it any more sweet. It probably made it would have made it not as sweet for you as a as a memory. By not if I hadn't, that. if you know I, I, mean? I charged for it, and yeah. that's and that's yeah. and that's awesome, Doug. Yeah. I mean, like, I I love that. That's a yeah. great story. It's amazing, yeah. amazing. Yeah. The pictures are amazing, yeah. and that's 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 naturopathy or natural medicine and orthodox medicine combined. Yeah. That's, that's that's beautifully, that that's how it should work. Sort of thing, yeah. yeah. That's that's exactly right. Well, that's the thing that I love so much about what Steve taught me is because diet is so fundamental. I mean, one of the things that we haven't talked about is, is my surgical work that I do, which is mm. mostly in orthopedics. And guess what the most common problem is that's related, that you see in people who need joint replacement surgery, knees and hips? What do you think is the most common problem? I won't diet. say. Hmm? What, diet? Well, sort of, sort but of. what else? What does a bad diet cause? What does a bad diet cause, exactly? With inactivity. What? Um, obesity. Oh, of course. I'm not even thinking. 140 that. kilos, 130 kilos. I had a 24 year old who weighed 139 kilos. Wow. For an orthopedic procedure, not for a replacement, for an orthopedic procedure, though, he was having trouble with the knees. 140 kilos. That's a lot of stress 20. on the joints. It's, it Crazy. is. It's massive. Yeah. And it's because of carbs. And, and, and the thing is, actually, <laughs> I remember I was talking to, I think it was um, the doctor that did my knee, knee surgery, and he said, well, when you go back to play football, he goes, um, you know, if you're at your ideal weight, he goes, every kilo over that when you're running, and it, mm. correct me, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, you'll probably correct me if I'm wrong, he said puts when you're running puts an extra seven kilos, you know, on that joint. So, if you, you know, in terms mm. of under stress. Yeah, under stress. So, yeah. so when you're running and you're changing direction and all the rest mm. of it, if you're 10 kilos overweight, that's an extra 70 kilos oh. on that joint, right? Yeah. Horrendous. So now obviously we've got a yeah, I don't know the maths of it, but that yeah. I, I don't dis disagree with what yeah. you told you. Yeah. So, I mean, again, the, the lighter you are, yeah. the, the, the better your joints are going to feel, you know, and which means that the more active you're going to be, which means it's going to be easier to keep the weight off. Well, the, the fat cells secrete a hormone called leptin, which actively destroys cartilage. Yeah, and that right. was only discovered in uh, 08, I think, was the first paper have I read on. Have we spoken about that? Oh, I think I so. I don't think we have. Really? Well, I don't know. Oh. I don't think we've spoken about that. Well, we could that. do a podcast on, on the so effects leptin, of obesity. So being overweight. Yeah, I mean, it does other things. Leptin. It's stress, physical stress, of course, and being weight. But leptin is a hormone secreted from fat cells that tells your brain to stop eating. Well, uh, It's supposed to be to get yeah. leptin resistant if you eat a lot of carbohydrates. Yeah, so that's yeah. why you can eat rice and feel hungry 10 seconds later. Right. Or lollies. Um, so leptin. Uh, actively destroys the cartilage. So it's really a quite a dangerous hormone. It's created from the adipocytes or fat cells Wow! when they're full. Mm. Huh. And very yeah. inflammatory yeah. chemicals and all nasties. You'll be, you'll be stunned that, uh, as, I, as I often am in theatres, I keep thinking, what do my joints look like? <laughs> 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 um, but, you know, you'll see relatively young people look, doing arthroscopies on them, you know, where you can look inside the joint and th to see the loss of articular cartilage at amazingly young ages. I mean, I, I've been ass assisting for 12 years now and, you know, the age group for most patients was 60 and above and it's now down to 40 and above mm, um, because we're seeing that level of, of joint damage. I mean, you look inside the joint and you think, well, there's nothing else you can do. There's no – we can't – we haven't yet learned how to replace joint cartilage. No. Yeah. And until we do, then they're just going to have to keep on putting artificial joints in. But the yeah. solution is to get – 
people's weight down. I, 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 I love the story. I wish I could remember what it was in relation to. It was on TV one night and they basically had a, a shot of a street. I can't remember if it was Melbourne or Sydney, but let's say it was George Street in Sydney, the main street of Sydney. And it was taken in 1950 or 45 <laughs> or something. Like that. And there's all these people with suits on and blah, 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 but they're all thin. Yes. Not thin as in too thin, mm. thin as in normal. Lengthy, yeah. And then they show exactly the same street and exactly the same crowd. And it's like, oh, my God. I saw a photo ex- vir- virtually identical to that. I think it was um, <clears throat> uh, people walking along uh, the Riviera or overseas somewhere, right, mm. and they're all walking. And you're looking at them guys, girls, in their bathing suits and, of mm. course, you know, the guys wearing the little trunks and all mm. the rest of it. And and, and literally there, there was – I actually don't remember if I saw anyone that was overweight. Mm. It showed exactly the same uh, scenario with the people walking mm. around with their their togs on, their bathing suits, and almost the opposite was true. Yeah. It was almost spot crazy. the 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 thin person, right? It's, it's just crazy. Yeah. We'll have to get you back to do a general practice one because <laughs> we've done a massive. <laughs> I'm a bit oh, rusty on that. I haven't done general practice that, for a that's while. That's what it's all about. About the history of it. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, me. It really oh, does. There's, there's so much that we didn't cover off on a lot of these things, Doug. But it's always well, nice having you on because it's yeah. good to have a chat. It's good to find out what what's uh, important to you. And I, I think there's a lot of people listening to this out of interest. There's a lot mm. of people listening out of this for hope. I think there's a lot of people going, okay, maybe I'm not happy with something. And I, as I said, if you don't like it, go fix it. Go change it. One of the other, we just go back. We didn't finish off the conversation about how to pick out your know, the physician you go oh, to. Yeah. There's one other thing I would put in there. So, yes, I would look to what are their qualifications, you know, what are their training background, you know, blah, blah, blah. But there's one other thing, and it applies. I always tell this to any patient I refer to a specialist for treatment, is you need to like them. Yeah, right. Okay? You really do. You need to like – if you don't like that person for whatever reason, don't, don't, I don't care how qualified they are, do not go to them. Mm. Because well, what, things do go wrong mm. yeah. and you need to believe and trust the person that you're working with. Yeah. And if you don't like them, you're going to make the whole life much, much, much more complicated. And often the reason why you don't like them is because they're not all that good. Mm. Um, but, yes, always like the person that's treating you, treat, as long as they treat you well and, and you feel comfortable in their presence. Um, then you've probably found the right person. Well, the, uh, I did my knee playing football. Lost 11 mils of cartilage blew out, um, which wasn't fun, mm. and went and so I had to go and see a surgeon. And it was actually uh, Steve, and he recommended oh, um, Dr. <laughs> um, uh, Alan was it Hadley. No, what, what's his name? Again? Bryce Galley. Uh, Bryce Galley. Yeah. And um, uh, he was great. He was excellent. Mm. But the first thing that you asked me when I saw you, because I haven't seen you since then, was did you like him? Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? It's, just, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Mm. But it's, that, that is important. It is. It's yeah. very important. You need to like the doctor that yeah. you're going to because you won't trust them if you don't. Yeah. You know, if you if you have a negative reaction to them as a person, mm. you'll tend to not trust them. Yeah. And there may be a good reason why you don't trust them and there may be not a good reason. Yeah. Um, but, yes, you need to like the person. And if in doubt, don't. That's another big one I, I reckon as well too, especially where it comes to these things. If you're umming and ahhing and have to talk yourself into it, probably don't. You know, mm. b- better better to be cautious than to, to be sorrowful. Well, again, you know? I think that's that's part of the part of being a good doctor. Um, I mean, I spend a lot of my lifetime talking patients out of things. Yeah. Too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And my general rule, if I am going to treat, is not to try and do everything in one go. I want to do it over a, gradually over a period of time for two reasons. One, because I have less complications. And secondly, if I do have a complication, I'll know exactly what caused it and where the problem is because yeah. I haven't over-treated them. Yeah. Uh, and last but not least, their friends won't notice. Yeah, funny. And I've got one last question because then I appreciate we've got to wrap yeah. this up. Yes, we've been going. It's great. I've enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Oh, I love <laughs> it. I'm going to have a chat with the microphone. Off oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I, love I love it. And that's kind of the way that we want to do things. But if there was one thing in the last – few years that's come along where you've gone that's brilliant like you know obviously botox was a game changer just like um uh, uh the little blue pill was a game changer in, in in performance in the bedroom right there's been one sort of breakthrough i mean again we we're talking about lasers before i know that you like dermabrasion mm. but if there's been something that's come through where you've gone you know what I, I, I love that that's great whether it's in your field or you've seen it in another field around cosmetics is there mm. anything that you've gone and gone that's that's really great um, I, I sort of yes and sort of no to the answer I'm going to give you. I would have said robotic surgery. Yeah, right. um, I think the first thing I like to if we got to say is that in robotic surgery, the robot doesn't actually do the surgery. Uh, the yes. surgeon does the surgery. <laughs> yes. Okay, but the robot assists. And I was actually in, in an operation this week, where, and they were doing a shoulder replacement. 
on somebody, okay? And they're, they're doing it using a robotic technique, which I'd never seen done before. And this is a bit technical, but one of the most difficult parts of the operation is you have to put a, a new um, cuff on the, on the shoulder, on the uh, scapula. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, they have to screw it into place to hold it. Mm -hmm. And the screws have to go exactly where you want them to go. They have to go into the spines of the scapula because that's the only safe place to put them. Mm -hmm. And typically for before the robot, the surgeon would have to sort of try and feel around the back of the scapula to work out where to put his where to put his screw, and he wouldn't have he'd sort of have to be careful about how deep he, he made the hole to put the screw in and all that sort of stuff. But in this particular case, the patient had had a CAT scan done, a computerized axial tomography scan done of the shoulder, and that was sitting up on a screen in front of him. The robot basically was linked to that screen, so it could see if you touched the the, the thing with the, with a probe, the <laughs> robot will show you exactly where on the scapula you were. Wow. Okay, so when the guy was putting the screws in, all he had to do was line them up on the screen up there and know exactly how far in to put them. Man, like a computer game. I can do it. Yes. <laughs> so why, why is that important? It just made it so much easier oh, it's amazing. for the surgeon to do That's what he had to do. That's great technology. So it's, it was good for the patient. There's no risk of hitting major blood vessels which are yeah. in that area and blah, 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 speed of the operation up and all that sort of thing. Recovery, yeah. And so Recovery. I would say that, yeah, that that kind Robotic. of thing makes a difference. Uh, I really do. Um, yeah. I really love that story about the robot because at the end of the day, um, uh, any form of advancement that can obviously make surgery easier, safer, faster, better recovery. Mm. You know, that's 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 really exciting. Awesome. Mm. I've heard that they're using um, it for even doing hair transplants and that now. But oh, they really? reckon it's not as good as the original because it's like an artist. There's hope it? for me. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, it's Ooh, very artistic yeah. hair transplantation. That, that's it because it doesn't be look natural. Yeah, the yeah. people who are good at it are very good at it. Yeah, the like people who are, uh, yeah, the people who aren't artistic are not very good at it. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. can't just stick air follicles all over the place. It doesn't work. No. Nah. No, it looks terrible. Oh, it's good sorry to know, Steve. Yeah, yeah well, well, we're going to go down and get a two for one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ten percent discount over. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, what was I going to say? Well, thanks, Doug. It's yeah, been thanks, awesome mate. having thanks you here. Yeah, I really you. enjoy the conversations because there's so much, and literally, we only scratched the surface. Yeah, I was going to say we had a much bigger list than that, didn't well, we? Yeah. Way, way bigger. We'll have to get you back. We've well, talked about some funny. Back? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've well, enjoyed it. It's a great conversation. Well, you and I. Yeah, yeah, we love it. We spent all day yaki doing. So noise our wives immensely. No, it's great though. But and again, it's. It's two ends of the professional. It's yeah. the doctor and and obviously the the naturopath. I mean, again, Steve, I appreciate it. that's a bit crude because you've also got background in chemistry as well too. So. We're scientists. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. Well, that's right. I think that's really the key. Thank you, Steve, and I totally agree that yeah. Steve and I are scientists. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I have a science degree, so I'm allowed to say I'm a scientist. I'm yes. A scientist. And that's what we gets us irritated the most is yeah. when people are not scientific about but claim to be. Then they say we follow the science. There's no such <laughs> thing as the science. <laughs> But Doug, thanks so much for coming uh, up. And I was going to say we'll definitely have you back on. And what mm -hmm. I'd like to do is maybe cherry pick some um, uh, some topics where you're an expert on, which I'm, your breadth of expertise mm -hmm. is obviously very wide. But specifically on skin, maybe we can talk about some of the different you know fractional lasers. Maybe we can talk about dermabrasion and really get into that. But a lot of people are going to be listening to this, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who have got very bad skin and acne. Potentially in Australia, look, you're welcome to come over from anywhere else in the world mm. now that we've got the borders open. Yeah. But if they want to find out, if they want to talk to your clinic, if they want to, you know, talk to you about treatment or something like that around acne, how do they reach you? Mm, that's a difficult question. Um, uh, obviously, uh, you, you were talking about by email or by email, type, type or things. do you have a website? Uh, where's your no, practice? I tend to hide. Like? Actually, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so do I. I try to keep a very low profile. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I do have. I work at a clinic in Ravina, yep. and uh, that's obviously the, the. It's called Rejuvenate Cosmetics. It has an email. Uh, you know, it has a websites and all that sort of yep. stuff, and they can sort of put things through there. Yeah, great. great. Um, but, but anyway, thanks again, Dave. That's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It was a fun conversation. Yes. I enjoyed it greatly and I appreciate the honour of being asked to appear. Always. We'll have you back. Absolutely. Thank it's you. great. Thanks. All right. Thank All right. you. Thanks, guys. Bye now. Bye.